So I thought that what I should do, because we've got people from all sorts of different backgrounds, is just um, sort of review a lot of basic ideas about information and entropy in biology uh, so that we all have a sort of uh, equal, we're all on an equal playing ground, at least approximately. So the goal of this workshop, incredibly ambitious as it is, is to unify various ways that information and entropy are used in biology. And there's really quite a number, and I'm probably leaving a bunch out. So people working on biological communication systems use information theory as a tool based on the premise that since biology is always optimizing things, you might be able to uh, use the qu quantitative notion of information as a way to, to make predictions about how biology will behave in its attempt to optimize uh, communications. And communication, of course, is occurring at, at many different levels in biology. Uh, there's a lot of work on what's called the action perception loop, which is a way of thinking about uh, how an organism behaves as it perceives its environment and uses that information to make decisions uh, which then in turn affect the environment in a, in a kind of feedback loop and we'll maybe hear a little bit about that. Then going over from the more explicitly Shannon-esque information theoretic side of things to the, uh, the entropy side of things, entropy is the driving force uh, the second law of thermodynamics, the increase of entropy, is the driving force behind chemistry, which underlies biology. So th there's that, which at first may seem separate, but has got to obviously be part of the same story. Um, then there's a lot of work on trying to understand the structure of ecosystems, how many organisms of different types you can expect to find in an ecosystem. And John Hart will be talking about the maximum entropy approach to, to that. Uh, in a somewhat different line of work, as far as I can tell, but it should be very related, different kinds of entropy are being used as ways to measure b biodiversity, um, at, which, which could be used uh, as a kind of diagnostic of the health of, of an ecosystem. And finally, there's a lot of work on evolutionary game theory and evolution more generally, which... and some of this work on evolutionary game theory that we'll be hearing about takes an explicitly information theoretic uh, approach where you, you, you focus on the ability to, to acquire information as a, as a way to uh, foster the fitness of the organization or also think of the whole uh, population of organisms as having information about its environment. So these all seem a bit different but unified, at least at the zeroth level, by the presence of these ideas of information and entropy. So, someone has to say this so that no one else does. So, the <laughs> so that no one else needs to. The Shannon entropy is most simply defined for a probability distribution on a set, typically a finite set, no, but no reason it needs to be here, as the sum of the probability times the logarithm of the probability with a minus sign thrown in front to make it always greater than or equal to zero. So it's, it's minimized when the probability is one for one particular point in the set and zero elsewhere, and it's maximized at the completely constant flat probability distribution. So in a very simple sense, it's telling you uh, the, the entropy is bigger when the probability distribution is more evened out or more flat but Shannon argued very convincingly that it, this number is a w good way to measure how much information you learn upon discovering the value of an element of S that's been randomly chosen according to this probability distribution. So at first you don't know uh, wh what, what the element is, you just know this probability distribution, and then you, you, someone, tells you, someone flips the coin or whatever and picks an element distributed that way, you learn something, and this is how much on average you learn. 
It doesn't matter what base of the logarithm you use, so don't start arguing about that, kids. Um, so you could use, <laughs> some people do, which is the only reason why I'm saying, say, acting like that. It just seems silly to me. You can use base 2, and if, then you're measuring information in bits, but f in physics it's very common to use base E, which is a very natural kind of logarithm. Uh, and then you're measuring information in nats. I think it, they should be called nits, but that would be nitpicking. All of this generalizes from sums to integrals, but then you need a measure to do your integral, and so uh, we, we don't need to get into that now, but it's, of course, a very important generalization. So Shannon was interested in this from the point of view of communication, and he has some theorems that, that are good to at least know the existence of so that you feel guilty and want to, want to learn them. Uh, one of them is the source coding theorem, that, which puts a bound on how much you can compress a signal. Think of it as like a string of symbols from some chosen alphabet. And suppose that uh, each s symbol is independently and in the, uh, identically distributed. So independently chosen at random from the same set, of s set S of letters with some fixed probability distribution. So you, you get these these strings coming at you, and you'd like to encode them, to compress them, uh, in, to, to rewrite them in terms of some coding system, in terms of some other alphabet, uh, and squash them down if possible. And his theorem says that in the limit where the signal becomes very long, you can find a way to encode each symbol using a string of bits, for example, uh, which has length equal to the entropy of that probability distribution in, in base two, plus a little bit epsilon. You can't quite get down to the, to the bare bones, but you can get as close as you want with as small a probability of error as you want. Uh, so, so, th so, the, so the entropy is really the, uh, the measure of how, much, how many bits you need to express a signal in this limit of long signals. And he also showed that, that that's the best you can do. You can't use less than that without, well, uh, while still keeping an arbitrarily small probability of error. So that really gave the uh, information interpretation. Uh, then he had some other results, which I won't describe nearly as precisely. So one was the noisy channel coding theorem, which says, now suppose that in addition to trying to code the signal, the signal is then passed through a channel in which there is some noise. So the, 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 the signal is, is randomly perturbed or changed. Um, so you'd like to ask, uh, the, you'd like to know how, what the channel capacity is, that is the maximum number of bits per word that you can tr transmit through a given noisy channel with an arbitrarily small probability of error. And I won't get into this, but it uses a crucial idea of mutual information, which is a measure of how much information two different random variables have in common. And it's applied, in this case, to the mutual information between the, the, the uh, signal going into the noisy channel and the signal going out. That, that mutual information is how much information is making, making it through the channel. So, so the idea is uh, to think of probability distributions in a slightly different language as random variables. So if somebody talks about a pair of random variables, x and y, all they really mean is a probability distribution on a product of sets, S and T. So the first random variable you think of as being valued in the set S and the second one in the set T. So if you have a probability distribution on a product of two sets, then you can, you, you can project it down to either one of the two sets. And so you get two probability distributions, one on S and one on T. So that means we have three different probability distributions running around. Uh, and so there are three different entropies that you can calculate using that formula that I gave. So there's the entropy of the, uh, of the probability distribution on S times T, which is called the joint entropy. So it's how much information there is in both those random variables. And then there are the individual entropies, H of X and H of Y, which are the entropies of the probability distributions you get on S and T by, by projecting them down. That is by summing up the, n the numbers 
to get probability distributions here and here. And then from those, you can, count, you can make up some other things. And so you can imagine uh, that, that H of X is the area of this uh, pink circle, and H of Y is this area of this uh, blue circle, and of H, X, Y is the, is the area of the, of the whole figure here. And then you can decompose the area of the whole figure into three parts this way, uh, just using the obvious formulas that you would get by, tr by treating them as areas. So the mutual information is the area of the, is the, is what corresponds to the area of the overlap. So it's, you add up the information in X and the information in Y and subtract out the information in both. And so this has the natural interpretation is how much information is in common between X and Y. So how much, how much knowing about one of those random variables tells you about, about the other. And then these uh, crescent moon-shaped regions also have names. Uh, this one here you'd call the information of X conditioned on Y. So the idea of it is it's how much information you know, uh, how much entropy there is in X assuming you know the value of Y. So you take the information or entropy of the pair of random variables and you subtract out that of Y and that's what, what's left. So this is like how much new stuff you learn when you, someone tells you X if you already knew Y. So these are ideas that I imagine people will be using a lot, so I thought I should just define them all. Yes? Uh-huh. I, I want to, um, um, but, I, but I know that, that other people don't. So uh, uh, people who want to draw distinctions between them, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not going to tell people what to do, but I, but I urge people to, you know, to be cl clear about you know, what they're, uh, about how they're using words. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, th so those, the, the right, so the, so, you know, the more ignorant you are, the more you learn when someone tells you something, <laughs> roughly speaking, so, so you can think of entropy as the, the ignorance you have when all you know is the probability distribution P and, and, and then the, and the information you but it's also equal to the expected amount of information you gain when someone tells you a random ver the, the value of a of a point in that set chosen according to that probability distribution. Yeah. So I, I, I that's how I think of it. Um, so of course we can have hours arguing about this. People have spent uh, centuries arguing about this. In fact, um, partially because entropy was developed in physics and then information was introduced by Shannon and it wasn't so clear that they were the same thing, even though the formula was exactly identical. Uh, so Shannon's other big achievement, wh which I know even less about but feel I n the need to mention, is rate distortion theory. So here you have an extra ingredient. You have a distance function or metric on your set of symbols. So you seek to encode them in a way that lets your signal be reconstructed to within some distance. So the idea is that um, you know, the distance between the words cat and feline may be small, but the distance between cat and dog is large. If, you, if, you, if your coding has an error, it would be much less harmful to mistake cat for feline than cat for dog. Uh, so, this, so here you want to uh, transmit a signal with a bound on, on the on the distance, and that, that distance is called the distortion. And you're trying to do this, achieve this using the minimum number of bits per symbol. So he, has a th he began a theory of this. This I don't think is capsulated in a single one beautiful theorem proven by Shannon, but there are a lot of theorems about it by now, and he proved some. So all these ideas could be important in uh, 
understanding communication of all sorts, but for biology, communication between organisms, certainly. The nervous system, which communicates signals in a number of ways, for example, nerve impulses, but also chemically through neurotransmitters. There are many other forms of intercellular communication, and I know almost nothing about them. I learned a new word, cytokine. So besides hormones, which I think we've all heard of is a kind of what, uh, intercell intercellular communication system, like adrenaline and so on, there are other things, uh, one of which cytokines are ways that s cells communicate with their neighbors to, to make them move around in certain ways and, and do all the things they need to do. It's so there's a lot of communication going on there. And then, of course, going, we're sort of going back in time evolutionarily, uh, back to the basics. So there's intracellular communication. The expression of genes is a form of, of communication, but equally so is the gene regulation, the regulation of genes by the, uh, so how they, the genes, the uh, epigenetic phenomena where genes, uh, what, what they express is... Uh, affected by their environment within the cell. So the idea roughly is that if biological communication is being nearly optimized by evolution, we should be able to use Shannon's ideas on optimal communication. He was trying to optimize signal communication, but generalized in some manner to help generate testable hypotheses. But it's really important to be careful here that always keep in mind that in biology, communication is always just a means to, a, to an end. Natural selection is maximizing fitness, not bits per second of, uh, of communication. And also, uh, it's, perception is nothing like just a, a sort of a, a simple transmission of some string of bits from the environment into the brain. The brain has reasons for wanting to know certain kinds of information and, and so it, it's actually also sending out its hypotheses down the other direc direction uh, through the nervous system. So it's, it's much more complicated than you might think if you were just like trying to model this on, on Shannon's idea of like trying to make a telegraph line that works very well. But, but still there may be use to these ideas of information. So communication typically deals with small numbers of bits, and I would consider even terabytes, small numbers of bits of relevant information. That's all very small compared to the complete description of a physical object, like a cup of water, down to the atomic scale. That uses a lot more information, most of which is irrelevant for understanding the macroscopic properties of, of that object. So this irrelevant information, this irrelevant microscopic information is called entropy by physicists. And it's important to realize that it dwarfs the amount of information that we think of when we're uh, trying to focus on relevant information. So your genome contains about 10 billion bits. Uh, all words ever spoken by human beings, that's a fun thing to try to estimate. Someone has estimated as about four times 10 to the 19th bits. If you just total up the information of genomes of all living humans, not keeping track of the fact that of course you could compress it vastly because we're all quite similar, just adding it up, you'd get six times 10 to the 19th bits. But then if you look at one gram of water at room temperature and you take its entropy, which you can look up in a table and calculate that, to turn that into bits, you see that that's four times 10 to the 24th bits. To completely specify everything about the water down to the quarks and so on. Um, so there's a lot of, so, so, so when we're trying to compare information of the sort that's relevant to information that's the sort that's irrelevant, it's, it's, it's like comparing mice with, with elephants. There's always much more of this irrelevant stuff. Uh, and, and, and that's part of why people have had trouble synthesizing their ideas of information and entropy. So for example, there could be some information in an encyclopedia, but the amount of entropy you generate when you say burn the encyclopedia it's like vastly greater than, than the bits of relevant information in the encyclopedia. So, so you don't like get more, 
You don't get much more or less heat from burning an encyclopedia that it has more or less uh, words written on it. Uh, and so, so you may think of them as like completely different things. But when you work with very microscopic systems, then it becomes apparent that they really are just two aspects of the same thing. With very microscopic systems, the distinction between what's the relevant macroscopic information, what's the irrelevant information, sort of dissolves. Yes? Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yes. So you notice I didn't say that it didn't make any difference. I said it made very little difference. Right. Yes, that's right. So it makes so little difference on that macroscopic scale that, that uh, you know, we don't like try to buy uh, special textbooks to burn to heat up our room more. Well, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, but, but, or less or whatever. Um, but, but right, when you start wor- wor- worrying at the, at the very microscopic scale, then it becomes apparent that there really is a difference and it's very, very interesting. Um, so anyway, they, they must be part of the same picture in biology, but fitting them together is a, a sort of tricky business. But what's not tricky, well, it is tricky. <laughs> what's, more, what's less tricky, but still actually uh, complicated business, is this tendency we observe uh, for information to shift from more relevant to less relevant forms. And that's the idea of the second law of thermodynamics, that entropy increases. And that's what's powering chemistry and thus biology. So, so that's another aspect of entropy. Right, but then is that definition of entropy? Is there a conflict with the one you did My first definition had nothing to do with relevant or irrelevant. It was just like you have a probability distribution on some set of alternatives and you have an entropy to it. Um, I'm just saying that that um, that physicists, uh, when they talk about you know the entropy in a cup of water, or the entropy in an encyclopedia, that amount that entropy is dominated by the, uh, the, the by the by the irrelevant sort, the, the sort that you can't uh, detect macroscopically. And so you can, yeah, you can try to make up a mathematical theory about what's the relevant sort and what's the irrelevant sort. Uh, but I'm not going to attempt to formalize that. The word that you might attach to that too is like sufficiency. Is the relevant part? Yeah, uh-huh. Why am I mixed up now? Sufficiency because of the predicting features of... Uh-huh. So... So uh, for physical systems in equilibrium, they tend to maximize entropy. That's a cousin of the second law uh, of thermodynamics. And this idea uh, has undergone an evolution from Boltzmann and and Gibbs to Jaynes, who really saw clearly the, the wide applicability of this idea of maximum entropy. So in its modern uh, general form, the idea is that if, you're, if your job is to choose a probability distribution, which will be your hypothesis about a situation. So you have a situation which can take, in which some uh, variable can take many different values. You're, you're not trying to guess what value it takes. You're just trying to guess a probability distribution of values that it takes. How do you guess what's the right guess? The maximum entropy method says you pick the guess you pick your P that maximizes entropy subject to whatever constraints you want it to obey. So, for example, subject to constraints uh, saying that the expected values of certain things you know are what you know they are. But whatever constraints you may have, you can impose them, and then you maximize, you find the P that maximizes entropy subject to those constraints. So the most classic example is if you've got a specific function on your set, f, a real valued function, and you want to choose p that maximizes entropy subject to the constraint that the expected value of this function, f, is some chosen number c. So this is your constraint here. The expected value of f is equal to c. Then it was realized by, certainly by Gibbs, maybe uh, to an extent by Boltzmann, 
that you should pick this function. This is the answer to the problem. You, you, you pick the probability of the ith uh, alternative here to be e to the minus beta times that function, and then divide out by a normalizing factor such th to make these probabilities sum to one. Well, the question is then, what beta should you pick? Well, it turns out that just depends on what value of c you want. So if you start with this pr probability distribution p, which depends on beta, you can calculate c. So you can calculate c as a function of beta. So for any particular beta, it will maximize entropy subject to the con this constraint for some particular choice of c. But then you have to invert that if you start out knowing c, you, 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 you have to invert that process to solve to figure out what beta to pick. And all of this generalizes in the most pleasant and obvious way when you have a bunch of functions. You just, you just uh, get a bunch of terms up here added up and a bunch of different betas. So physicists have been using this kind of method for a long time, so they have developed it to a really high art uh, for systems in thermal equilibrium. And Jaynes emphasized that you can use it much more generally. So for example, you could have a set of species, and let p of i be the probability that an organism you find in some region belongs to the ith species, and you can try to maximize the entropy subject to the constraints you happen to know. And John Hart will talk about how to use this in ecology. So it's interesting that in this particular example that I described here, the entropy is also used as a measure of biodiversity. So uh, people who weren't trying to predict behavior of ecosystems but just measure their biodiversity were led to thinking about the entropy. There, they also... Uh, became very interested in a generalization of, of Shannon's entropy called Renyi entropy, which depends on a, on a parameter. And uh, I guess Tobias Fritz will, will introduce it if it hasn't already been introduced, but I think it, it won't have been. Maybe it's just, I think maybe in the last, we'll see, but maybe just in the last day's talks, we'll see the, that there are other entropy besides Shannon's entropy. So you could ask here, is there a sense in which nature is trying to maximize biodiversity subject to constraints, if you put these two ideas together? That's a sort of strange and interesting thought. It obviously can't be that simple. Um, but there's an interesting thing that going on there. So suppose you've got a list of populations of n different species or replicators of any sort. Then, the then you can work out the probability that an organism belongs to the ith species, just it, its population divided by the total population. But now you can change your point of view and think of this probability distri distribution as a hypothesis, basically a hypothesis about what's the best way to survive, approximately. And then it's changed with time as a learning process. So natural selection eliminates some and favors others. And so that becomes very analogous in a precise way to a Bayesian updating of a hypothesis, improving the hypothesis as you gain more evidence. And you can make precise some sense in which, th uh, in which the ecosystem is gaining information through this evolution process. So, and you can do it using another notion of entropy that's ext or, the, or information that's extremely important which is the information of one probability distribution relative to another, sometimes called the kulbach leibler divergence. So there now you have two probability distributions, and, and you modify this uh, formula that we've seen before. And I guess you also very often throw out the minus sign, which <laughs> makes things even more confusing. Minus signs are the worst aspect of this whole subject. but. Uh, so what does this mean? This is the amount of information you have left to learn if P is your current hypothesis and Q is the, quote, true probability distribution dis describing a situation. I know Bayesians never like to talk about a true one, but we can pretend there's some true one and then say, how much would we learn when we went from our initial guess to the truth? On average, this is how much you would learn. 
So P is playing the role of a prior, Q is a posterior. So then here's an interesting thing, which Mark Harper will talk about some more. Suppose your population evolves according to a very general sort of equation, a replicator equation, so a first-order differential equation that says that the time derivative of the population of the i species is any old smooth function of the populations of all, all the species, uh, but then times the population of the i species. So this function is, is call, called the fitness of the i species, and it can depend on the populations of all the other species. Now suppose, this is a very limiting assumption, but a very interesting one. Suppose there exists a dominant distribution, Q. Very roughly, I'll say that's a mixture of species, a probability distribution of species whose mean fitness is at least as great as that, that of any other mixture it could find itself amidst. So you imagine you have some other probability distribution of species, and you just sort of put a little droplet of species in there distributed according to the probability distribution Q, you can work out the mean fitness of the, of the, of the pre-existing distribution and compare it to the fitness of, of the mean fitness of these guys in this droplet that you put in. And we're assuming that uh, Q, the fitness of Q is, is greater than or equal to that of the resident ex pre-existing species. In that case, then Aiken and Lozert proved that you have a kind of uh, monotonicity that, that, the, that this uh, relative information will always decrease as the... So here P of T is evolving according to the replicator equation. Q is this dominant distribution. And you can show that the, that the probability distribution P will get closer and closer to the dominant distribution. So you can think of that as the ultimate goal. Uh, but, but what's happening is that this is a way of, s of making quantitative the sense in which it's getting closer. The, the information keeps decreasing. So you can interpret this as saying the information that the population has left to learn as it goes from where it is now to the ultimate goal is always decreasing. So it's learning, in other words. There's less information left to learn. So it's learning. Yes? Um, I don't think so. So first of all, one thing to note is that, is that this is a nonlinear, this is potentially nonlinear differential equation. So this isn't a Markov process. I mean, a special case would be a Markov process uh, when, when these were just all constants, for example, when these were, you'd get a Markov process. Um, and you're right that in a Markov process, if you take two probability distributions and evolve them in time, then the relative information always decreases no matter what they are. Um, but as far I've fiddled around with some calculations, and Mark probably knows better, but I suspect that, that, that if you put Q of T, where it was just any other guy evolving according to the replicator equation, that it wouldn't be true. I, think, I, th I don't think so. In other words, no, I think is the answer to the question. Yes? Uh-huh. Okay, so you're saying that we... Hmm. Okay, we'll have to talk about that a little more. More. I mean, here it's not only time-dependent, but it's dependent on the state. Right, it depends. Even that's okay? Okay. Hmm. Well, okay, well, that, then, then, then you can think of this as a special case. Mm, I don't know. Yeah, I, someone asked me something about this once, and I found some kind of counterexample to something <laughs> like what you're saying, but I, but I, but I can't, can't really uh, remember. So that would be great if you could generalize this. I'd love, I'd love that. So Mark Harper will talk about this some more. 
So that's where I'd like to leave off. So that was just an example of a sort of more technical result. But there's a huge range of ideas that we have to uh, play around with at this workshop. So I hope we just uh, do, do everything that we can think of. OK, thanks. So I guess the schedule says we've got some time for questions, followed by the more important thing, which is coffee. Uh, so we're, we're already getting some questions that are really intriguing to me. This is perhaps the most specialized technical part of the talk. But um, I've been really fascinated by all these kind of monotonicity laws, saying, you know, saying that something is always increasing or always decreasing when you have probability distributions evolving in time in one way or another, because those are ways of making precise the second law of thermodynamics, different ways of making it precise. And so I would love to find like the, the master uh, equation, the, 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 w the one law of that type that implied all the other laws that I know. So maybe it's the, w the one that, uh, that, that you are saying that uh, time, time dependent Markov processes would all of which have the same. So you keep changing what Markov process you've got as a function of time, but uh, always with the same equilibrium distribution. OK, even more, John. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, see, uh, oh boy, chapter two, uh, even uh, yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> uh huh. Okay, I should definitely look at that. So I had, see, I got, might have discounted them because, uh, I mean, I shouldn't, but um, I had always thought that this is like some nonlinear thing. It's quite different from, or more, much more general than Markov processes. But I see now that I may be mistaken. Yes. Oh, whoops. We should have, yeah, sorry, we're violating the rules here uh, of the game. No, no, but it's being recorded. Yeah, it's not, it's not so that you guys can hear it, so that our massive crowd of followers on the internet can hear. <laughs> uh, so one of your slides began with the words, if biological communication is near optimized by evolution, which I found quite mysterious. Um, is someone going to explain what that means and why it might be true? Uh, well, there's a very, I was trying to reveal the, uh, the touchy nature of the, of the assumptions there. So, you know, there are many account, evolutionary accounts of, of organisms where you say the reason why it's doing this is because this is the optimal thing for it to do to, to uh, optimal in the sense of, of, uh, of uh, self self reproduction, and and but on the other hand, of course, if everything were always optimal, then nothing would be changing anymore. Presumably, everything would be perfect by now, uh, which is clearly not true. So, so you have to. So you, you can't really, with a straight face, say that everything has been optimized by, by evolution. And yet there is a sense in which that type of explanation in terms of optimization is a pretty powerful tool. Uh, and so I think you can say that many, a lot of optimization has gone on through the course of of, of Evolution, why we don't see underwater giraffes and, and things like that, uh, and and s uh, but of course trying to make that all really r rigorously precise, I think, is extremely difficult. I, it's not even clear to me in non-precise terms what the, the term biological communication means. Oh, oh. Um, I just meant that there's. Well, uh, first of all, I meant that you know it means lots of things. There's communication going on at many different levels. And so I mean all of those things, at least. Um, 
Well, but here I was, this is what I mean by biological communication. So as it's, you see, it's not, it's not some crystal clear idea. It's just like a whole list of things that most people will nod and say, yep, that's a kind of communication. Um, and then, so then, so, so transmission of information between or within organisms. Uh, but it, of course, the ho- maybe the harder part you're, you're pointing at is optimization. What, what do you mean by optimizing it? And so I was just saying that the, as far as people can tell, it seems like the solidest ground to stand on is the, is, is the, is the idea of, 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 uh, of trying to maximize fitness. So not trying, so any, any particular task that an organism does will only be optimized in the sense of that will only want to optimize that in the ex- to the extent that that's optimizing its fitness. So that's why I was emphasizing that you, c- you can't use the engineer's criterion of like trying to send as many bits per second down the telegraph line as the, as, as the, uh, as the criterion for optimization. And I th- mentioned that because apparently there were people who sort of did take that approach at first and then they found out that it just wasn't, wasn't working. Yes. Uh, that uh, the last line there, I think, is quite interesting. Uh, when you say maximize uh, fitness, it almost seems like this is a circular statement in some sense because it's not really clear. To, I mean, th- I, I believe in biologists do have uh, some, perhaps broadly accepted definition of fitness, but it's perhaps not so clear what fitness means <laughs> itself. So when you say maximize fitness, it's, it's circular in the sense that you could define fitness as that which is maximized. Well, that would be <laughs> so right anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> so th- if, if that's the case, the maximized fitness becomes a tautology in some sense. Right. I mean, there's a long conversation to be had about this, and there's, it has been had and is not done yet. Um, I'll just say that as a mathematician, I believe strongly in the power of tautologies. Almost every theorem I've proved is supposed to be a tautology, um, but some tautologies are more uh, useful than, than others. And so if you just say that, if all you say is that, you know, that is maximized, which is maximized, then that by, by itself doesn't help very much. Yeah, that's right. So I guess on, uh, continuing on that, I, I don't think, I, I have, as an evolutionary biologist, I have real trouble with that statement because... Natural selection favors increases in fitness. Okay. okay. But it doesn't mature, you know, we can find lots and lots of examples of where fitness is clearly far uh-huh. from being maximized. Yeah, okay, that, I should have, I sh- if I'd had enough room at the bottom of the slide, I should have definitely, well, uh, b- I, I, But I think that that's a, that's, it's, it's, from my experience, that's a common misconception that often uh-huh. people coming from different areas think, they think natural selection is very, all, is all powerful. Mm-hmm. And um, depending on what you're looking at and the sort of the nature of the state space y- you have, mm-hmm. um, it can be very um, ineffective. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can think about genome structures is the one that always comes to mind. Right. I, I had a question, though, because I'm the biologist in the room today. Or that's I the hope there's I'm, at that's, least that's, one that's, other that's, one. No, I'm sure there's more. I meant <laughs> to say that's sort of the hat I'm wearing. Uh-huh. Around you guys, okay. I'm, I'm a biologist. Yeah. Um, when you go to the equation where you had the replicator and you had the D P over DT, yep. and there was some discussion about um, whether or not that's Markov or not, and I, I couldn't quite follow that. But if I look at that equation, and I ignore the fact that it's continuous time, and just think, oh, okay, l- little small steps, uh-huh, d- discrete right. time, I- you're saying the next state is solely a function of the current state of the system. Right. So isn't that a Markov process? Not, not every, every Markov process has that property, but not everything with that property is a Markov process. So a Markov process is is a way for probability distributions to evolve in time that, that looks like this, where you have some matrix uh, and this matrix needs to have the property so that as you evolve P of I according to this uh, equation, that if initially it's a probability distribution, if that's true initially, that it stays that way. So that's the definition of a Markov process. And the main thing that's different between that and this is that this is just a a matrix of numbers. So this is a linear differential equation. Whereas this, this is, these f of i's can be any 
smooth function, so it's nonlinear. Another subsidiary difference is that here we're really describing the evolution of the, of the populations, not of the probabilities. So from this equation and from the relation between the populations and the probabilities, you can, make up a, you can work out another equation that describes how the probabilities change. But there, but if you view that as a, as a description of the evolution of the populations, then there's no drift or stochasticity in it. Right. If you think about it as a, as a probability distribution, then you're thinking that there's some kind of underlying random process. Well, I think this is treating it as a species of population class. Right. Like that. Yeah, there's no, right. So this is, so part of, part of what was supposed to be packed into that s sentence is that this, this is all having, yeah, no, uh, no, no uh, mutations. No. I, I seem. I once read that like physicists and, and biologists use drifts to mean completely opposite things. So for physicists, drift is like when something is moving along deterministically because like the water is sweeping it along, whereas for biologists, drift is something spreading out due to random processes. Okay. So I, yeah. So so there's no drift here in the biological sense. This is a deterministic equation. Uh, which yes, says that you know you could in principle compute the population of the organisms 20 years from now if you knew it exactly now. Uh, so this is so this is very simplified. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. See, there's another funny thing going on. So although this is a deterministic equation for populations. We're then playing a trick, a conceptual trick, where we're, from those populations, we're constructing a probability distribution. This is the probability that you, if you randomly pick an organism out of a hat, that it's of the ith type, which is sort of hard to do if the organism is very large. But anyway. Um, and so then, uh, so that's a different sense of probability. Uh, uh, sorry, could you give him the mic? Sorry, I'm afraid this we're violating the... So the point is about whether it depends on time, whether the rates depend on time or not. So if you allow your rates to depend on time, uh -huh. then you get it in much more generality. You get what is called a non-autonomous or non-stationary Markov chain. Right. If you say the AIJs do not depend on time, you get what is called an autonomous or uh, yeah, a stationary Markov chain. Yeah. But then how about... How about something like where these depend actually on the whole vector yeah, so of population? So you can do that too? I mean, you there's can do you that. can so do that. You can vary. It's, they're all functions of time, right? Well, but... It doesn't matter. So that's still... Well, a here, you, here it doesn't... De the, what the function is doesn't depend on where you are. But here it depends on where you are. So I think yeah, the second is strictly every more OD, general. Every ODE is a non-autonomous Markov chain. So, yeah, so that's... Huh. I'll have to think so about that a little I'll more. I'll bring in the definition sure. and Cover and Thomas tomorrow. Uh -huh. So there's a more general way of doing this where you just talk about random variables and their conditional dependence. So similar to what he said at the beginning, that hmm. if you know something, at t if you want to say what the value will be at time t plus epsilon, it only depends on what the value is at time t and not on the history, yeah. then that's a Markov chain. It's not, it need not be autonomous or uh -huh. okay. but it's a yeah. Markov chain. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we should have some coffee. Thanks.